morning and welcome to this the lecture number 17 of the course stochastic hydrology. Uh, if you recall in the last lecture uh, we discussed the ARIMA models and specifically how the AR and MA components <coughs> of the model behave. For example, we considered AR1 model formulated a theoretical AR1 model and saw how the correlogram of the theoretical AR1 model behaves and how the <coughs> spectrum behaves and how the PAC function behaves that is the partial autocorrelation function behaves. And then we also looked at <coughs> two examples of AR2 models and similarly for MA1 process we saw how the uh, autocorrelation partial autocorrelation function and the spectral density function behave. So, we essentially identify the number of AR terms and the number of MA terms <coughs> in a ARMA model by looking at the PAC function as well as the correlogram. But I, as I said in the last lecture, when you have both AR and MA terms in the model and they are slightly of higher order, let us say that you are talking about ARMA 4, 5, ARMA 4, 2, 4, 1, these kind of models where the number of AR terms is quite large and uh, the MA terms are also reasonably uh, large in number. Then identification becomes quite difficult and therefore, what we do is we formulate candidate models, several of candidate models and then for the candidate models we examine uh, we estimate the parameters and then examine whether the mo model is valid or not. Then we uh, also examined in the last lecture the procedure for parameter estimation. As I mentioned, there are several algorithms available for parameter estimation. And we introduced the MATLAB function Rmax, which can be readily used and uh, the, the parameters for any given ARMA type of model can be estimated. We uh, towards the end of the lecture, we examine the maximum likelihood criterion for selection of the models. The specific problem is that we have a number of candidate models, we have estimated all the parameters for the models based on the data. Uh, please do not lose sight of the hydrologic aspects of this. We have observed data for example, the stream flow at a particular location and then on these observed data we are doing all of this exercise. So, that we can fit a model for the time series that has been observed. So, once we formulate the candidate models and estimate the parameters for each of these models then we have to choose which among these candidate models is best suited for the observed data. This we do by two methods as I mentioned in the last lecture. One is the maximum likelihood criterion, which we use for uh, when your application is for long term simulation of the data. Then we use the maximum likelihood criterion. What we did in that, we defined a likelihood function, log likelihood function to be precise and estimate the like log likelihood function value for each of the models. So, each of the model will have one log likelihood value, then pick up that particular model which results in the maximum value of the log likelihood function value. Now, we will go to the second part of the applications of the model, where the models are meant not so much for a long term synthetic data data generation, but for one time real time uh, one time uh, forecasting models. That means, one time step ahead forecasting models. Like I mentioned these applications will be uh, for example, monthly forecasting of the stream flows, which may be useful for your real time operation of the reservoirs where you are operating the reservoir for irrigation, hydro power etcetera depending on the storage level and depending on the forecast of the flows you would like to operate the gates. This also becomes important when we are looking at smaller time periods like 
uh, 10 day time periods for uh, real time irrigation scheduling and so on. When we look at the applications these points will be clear, but essentially we use the, use the time series models to develop forecasting, uh, develop forecasts for uh, the reservoir inflows, evapotranspiration, rainfall and so, so on and so forth. So, when our applications are for short term forecasting, then the maximum likelihood criterion is not the criterion that we use. We must then go for the min minimum mean square error criterion. Now, that is what we will discuss in the uh, lecture today, how we develop the minimum mean square error uh, values for the models and then pick the best model that gives the minimum mean square error. So, the minimum mean square error criterion uh, or the MSC in short, which is also called as a prediction approach. What we do in this is that let us say you have 50 years of data, monthly stream flow data, then we use the first 50, uh, first 20, 25 years of data to formulate the mean square error. Let us look at uh, this uh, sketch here. Let us say that your time is on this scale and you have n values of the time series. We use the first n by 2 values typically for developing the model and then the remaining n by 2 we use for calculating the MSE. So, we calculate the mean square error with the remaining n by 2 values. What do I mean by that? Let us say that you have fit a AR1 type of model for using this particular data. When I say you have fit the model, it means that the parameters have been estimated for this particular model. How do I write this? We write this as x t is equal to in our notation phi 1 x t minus 1 plus epsilon t. Now, this is the model that we have, we have written and we have estimated the parameter phi 1 using one of the algorithms. Now, when we want to do use this model for forecasting, what does the forecast mean? Remember that this is a noise term here or a residual term uh, which has a 0 mean and they are all uncorrelated, the epsilon t are all uncorrelated. When we want to use this particular model for forecasting purpose, the forecast is the expected value for the next time period. Let us say that you are standing in time period t and you want to forecast for time period t plus 1. So, you are here now and you know the information that is available up to this particular point and you want to forecast for x t plus 1. Let us say that I write x t plus 1 is equal to phi 1 x t plus epsilon t plus 1. Uh, I am writing it for t plus 1 now. Then for forecasting whenever we say we want to forecast this using this particular model, what is it that we are doing? We want to get the expected value of x t plus 1 given the entire history up to time period t that is the problem. <coughs> So, we want to see what is the expected value of the flow for time period t plus 1 given the uh, value until x t. Now, to do this I will take the expected value of x t plus 1 now. Let us say I write x expected value of x t plus 1. So, I am taking the expected value of this particular expression is equal to phi 1 into expected value of x t plus expected value of epsilon t plus 1. Now, this is the forecast and we then generally denote the forecast by putting a cap on that particular variable. So, x t plus 1 cap which is the forecast for the time period t plus 1 is equal to phi 1 expected value of x t plus expected value of epsilon t plus 1. So, I will write expect the forecast 
x cap t plus 1 is equal to phi 1 expected value of x p x t I will write keep it as it is plus what is this? This has uh, the mean of 0 the epsilon t remember is a sequence which has a mean of 0. So, when you take the expected value of epsilon t or epsilon, epsilon t plus 1 that is 0 here. So, this is simply phi 1 expected value of x t. Similarly, you can uh, look at any models let us say that you want to take ARMA 1 on model here and then use it for forecasting. So, ARMA 1 1 model we write it as x t plus 1 let us say again we look at two time periods two adjacent time periods time t time t plus 1 you are here now and you want to forecast for the next time period. To keep the relevance with hydrology let us say that you are standing in the month of June and you have the flow information up to the month of June and you would like to forecast what is likely to happen to the next month that is the flow during the next month if you are looking at the forecast for flows. So, we will write this as x t plus 1 cap is equal to expected value of uh, ok I am sorry I will maybe I will write first the model here. So, ARMA 1 1 model we will write first uh, we write ARMA 1 1 model as for x t plus 1 is equal to I have 1 a r term. So, I will write this as phi 1 into x t I have 1 m a term. So, I will write this as theta 1 into e t plus e t plus 1 because I am writing for time period t plus 1. Now, you would like to forecast use this model for forecasting as I said what do we mean by forecast? Forecast is the expected value of the particular variable stream flow in this particular case for example, for the next time period t plus 1. So, we take the expected value of x t plus 1 I will write that as expected value of x t plus 1 is equal to phi 1 expected value of x t plus theta 1 expected value of e t plus e t plus 1. <coughs> remember here when you are writing a ARMA 1 1 model the E t term here is the residual arising out of the application of this model in the time period t. So, when you write this expected value of E t in this particular term the E t value is a constant it is not the expected value of t plus 1 that becomes 0. For example, we may be talking about expected value of 5 units and therefore, this, this becomes E t itself. So, I will write this as x t plus 1 cap is equal to phi 1 expected value of x t plus theta 1 e t plus expected value of x t plus 1 e t plus 1 which is 0. What is the, the difference here? What I did is that this is the actual value of residual that resulted from this. So, this is the actual value of residual that results from applying this particular model for the time period t. So, there was a residual there was a actual value that was available and then the expect the forecasted value was available. So, the actual value minus forecasted value gave me this E t value and therefore, when I take the expected value it becomes E t itself. So, I will write this as phi 1 expected value of x t plus theta 1 E t and this becomes 0 because these are all uh, nice terms and therefore, you write the forecasted value for time period t plus 1. Essentially then we are getting the forecasted values and applying for the first n by 2 terms that you have as I mentioned you have n by 2 here number of values and you have another n by 2 number of values. 
So, what we did? We have developed the model using this n by 2 number of values. This is a for model development. Uh, by model development, I mean we used all of these values to obtain the parameters of the candidate models. We had let us say for the forecasting, we had the models AR1, AR2, ARMA11, ARMA12 and so on. Uh, as I mentioned in the last class, when we are talking about the forecasting models, typically the lower order models in terms of the number of parameters will suffice. In fact, uh, when we see in the applications most of one, uh, the AR1 or AR1, AR2 model themselves will be sufficient for one time step ahead forecasting, uh, especially when we are talking about smoothened processes like monthly stream flows, seasonal uh, for flows and so on. So, we choose the candidate models which may be different from the candidate models that you would have chosen for long term synthetic generation of the data. We chose that and then developed the model using the first 10 by 2 values. Let us say if you had 50 years of values, you would have 50 into 12 that is 600 values is the data. This is number of years and this is number of months. So, you would have 600 values. So, use the first 25 years uh, data which is n by 2 to develop the model and then calculate the errors of using this model on one time step ahead forecasting for the remaining data, remaining part. What do I mean by that? Let us say that you chose your AR1 model. So, in the AR1 model you would have written your uh, expected value of xt is equal to phi 1 into expected value of X, uh, that is forecast for time period t plus 1 you would have written as phi 1 into x t bar or is equal to phi 1 expected value of x t. So, this phi 1 you would estimate based on the first n by 2 values of the data and then start applying this. When you start applying this let us say that you are now applying for the remaining n by 2 values and this is one time step ahead forecast. So, given x t now you had this x t value known you want to apply this. So, I will get x t plus 1 cap this is known x t is known. Typically let us say you are standing at the end of one month June month, the flow during the month of June is known. You want to forecast the flow during the month June or uh, July. Then we apply this phi 1 is known, phi 1 is estimated already. So, we apply this as x bar t plus 1 is equal to phi 1 into expected value of x t that becomes x t itself because it is known. So, this you get x bar t plus 1, but because you have the data already for this n by 2 this data is available. What we do? This is the forecasted value and x t is the actual known value of the flow. Let us say that you have x t available with you. So, I will write I will take the error error of forecast. So, uh, what will be the error of forecast x t plus 1 is your uh, known data I will say this is known data and x t plus 1 cap is your forecasted value. let us say known data value. So, the error I will write for the time period t plus 1 is equal to x t plus 1 minus x cap t plus 1. This is what is forecasted from the model. So, like this I get error. <coughs> now, <coughs> we are writing for 
the remaining n by 2 time periods. So, next time when I go let us say that I want to write for x t plus 2 now. So, I finished my forecasting problem for t plus 1. So, I come to t plus 2. When I am writing for the next time period we use the actual value that is known x t plus 1 to get for x t plus 2 the forecast not the forecasted value remember because this data is already available and the question that we are asking is standing at this point knowing the value up to this point what is my forecast for the next time period. So, x t plus 2 I will write this as phi 1 x t plus 1 the expected value of x t plus 1 which becomes x t plus 1 itself because this is known this is known here plus expected value of the error term which is 0. So, I will simply get x t plus 1 based on this x t plus 2 based on this. Then again calculate the error corresponding to x t plus 2 because uh, uh, the x t plus 2 forecast because you know the x t plus 2 value itself and therefore, you get errors of t plus 1 t plus 2 uh, errors corresponding to t plus 1 t plus 2 and so on. So, you formulate the error sequence using the error sequence then uh, you can get the mean square error. So, this is the procedure that we use to obtain the uh, errors of forecast. <coughs> so, the same thing is summarized here using a portion of available data which is typically n by 2 uh, estimate the parameters of different candidate models. Use this uh, forecasted models so developed all the candidate models one by one to get the series of forecasts one time step ahead by using the candidate models. And corresponding to each of these forecasts you know the error term get the mean square error and then pick up that particular model which results in the minimum mean square error. It is written more formally like this. So, one st time step ahead forecast for ARMA PQ model now can be written as x bar t plus 1 you have p of AR terms x j x t minus j plus you have q of uh, moving average terms j is equal to 1 to q phi j e t minus j the noise term has mean 0 therefore, it uh, uh, when you take the expected value it vanishes <coughs> and then the error for uh, one time step ahead forecast is e t plus 1 is equal to x t plus 1 which is the known value minus the forecasted value. Uh, once you know e t plus 1 then you get the mean square error mean square error is because you have used n by 2 number of values you sum over sum over all these errors uh, the squares of the errors and then divide by n by 2 you get the mean square error and choose that particular model among the candidate models among the number of candidate models to pick uh, the particular model which results in the minimum mean square error. All right, Now, uh, what did we do whether it is for long term simulation of the data or it is for uh, short, short term one time step ahead forecasting we use the models ARMA models and integration we used uh, for differencing. So, typically we difference the series first and then apply the ARMA model. So, whenever I say ARMA models the integration is applied uh, implied that is the differencing is already done and on that we are applying the uh, ARMA models. So, in either case whether it is use, uh, being used for long term sequence se synthetic generation or for short term duration of the data we use part of the data for calibration and parameter estimation the remaining part we are using it for validation type. Let us say you are using it for uh, long term simulation and it is of uh, ARMA type of model ARMA 1 1 or ARMA 2 1 etcetera. So, there is also a MA, uh, MA model available MA term that is available. Then what we do that we apply it for x t plus 1 get x t plus 1 you already have a known x t plus 1. So, the residue term e t plus 1 is got from the available data minus the model data. 
same principle as we did for forecasting. So, you generate corresponding to this term the residual series E t series. Similarly, if you are using it for the forecast the error of the forecast that we just uh, obtained there that error term becomes a uh, residual series. So, for the test data you have generated E t plus 1, E t plus 2, E t plus 3 etcetera up to all the values all the remaining values. So, you have essentially the residual series available with you after you apply the model. Now, for the validation of the model we test this residual series that you so obtained that means, you applied the model for the remaining n by 2 values or whatever uh, number of values that you have chosen for validation corresponding to each of the term you obtain either the residual or the forecast error. So, E t sequence is known on this E t sequence now we carry out all the tests. What are the tests? The tests if you if you recall when we uh, formulated these models we wrote the a uh, residual or the noise term E t and said that the noise term should have a 0 mean that is the first uh, assumption of the model. Next that it should be devoid of periodicities and it should be uncorrelated. So, we do 3 primary uh, tests primarily 3 tests we do one is to test the series that we have generated uh, namely E t series. This series has a 0 mean and that the series is devoid of any periodicities and also that the series is uncorrelated. So, we perform the test to so examine whether these assumptions that we have made that is the residual series has a 0 mean, no significant periodicities are present in the residual series and that the residual series is uncorrelated. How do we formulate the residual series as I said? this is E t is the residual is equal to X t which is the known data minus you have this term corresponding to the simulated data from the model. So, this is phi j X t minus j plus theta j E t minus j. So, this is how you calculate the uh, E t term. So, you have the sequence of E t is now on this sequence of E t we do the following validation test. One is significance of the residual mean that what, what is it that we want to test here that the mean of the residues that we so obtain have a mean of uh, is 0 the mean is 0. But obviously, it will not be exactly equal to 0 therefore, the mean should be not far away from 0. So, we say that the mean is not significantly different from 0 that is the test that we make in this. Similarly, significance of periodicities you may still have periodicities present in the data when you do the spectral analysis the spikes may still appear, but the periodicities that you uh, identify on the residual series when you carry out the spectral analysis must be insignificant all of them must be insignificant. Now, in this we do the uh, cumulative periodogram test for this and then we also do the white noise test to make sure that the series is uncorrelated. In the white noise test we will carry out Wittles test and Portmanteau test. Typically in most of these tests we formulate an appropriate statistic and then knowing the uh, knowing that that statistic follows either a f distribution or t distribution corresponding to critical values of f and t. We decide whether the particular series that we have passes the test or not. Uh, exception to that is the cumulative periodogram test where all the periodicities are tested uh, at once in one go. We will see the details of this. Now, so, for the significance of uh, residual mean it uh, examines the validity of the assumption that the error series E t has a 0 mean or the mean of the E t is not significantly different from uh, 0. So, we define I follow Kashyap and Rao's book here uh, this is a book reference is given here. 
we form a statistic eta e as n to the power half e bar by rho cap 1 by 2. Remember rho cap here is not uh, correlation, but it is a residual variance. So, you had the residual uh, series and the residual series you have calculated the mean that is residual series is E t this is given now and then E bar is associated with this is E t and rho cap is the variance of this E t and n is the number of values n is the data uh, sample length. So, you get n of e once you get uh, eta of e I am sorry eta of e eta of e is known to be uh, approximately distributed as t alpha n minus 1 where alpha is the significance level for example you pick 95 percent or 99 percent and then uh, you get the t alpha comma n minus 1 n is the number of data. If the value of eta e that you so compute using this is less than the critical t value this is a critical t value corresponding to the level of significance that you choose. If this value is less then the mean of the residual series is not significantly different from 0 and then we say that the series passes the test. Uh, it is pretty simple as uh, you can see the entire series is considered first uh, re residual series E t and then you formulate for the entire series you formulate one value of eta e which is a statistic and then look at compare the eta e so uh, you so compute with the t distribution of a specified alpha value and then look at whether this eta e value that you have computed is in fact less than the critical t value and then we say the series passes. So, that was the test for significance of the mean. Now, the mean may be 0, but still you may have periodicities present in the uh, residuals and the uh, residual series that you obtain from the model should be divided off any periodicities. Therefore, we look for significance of the periodicities and in fact, the residual series should not have any significant periodicities present in the data. Now, uh, I will discuss two uh, tests both of the tests are valid, but one is slightly superior to the other uh, as we presently uh, state. So, the first test again you formulate a statistic eta e is equal to gamma k square into n minus 2 by 4 rho 1 cap. Remember we are uh, doing the test for periodicities here we pick one periodicity at a time. So, the test is conducted for different periodicities. Let us say that the error series that you get has uh, some periodicities present. Let us say that this is a residual series and then you see that there are certain periodicities here like this. So, we pick the periodicity corresponding to this particular omega value first and then carry out this test. So, the k that I am mentioning here corresponds to the particular periodicity that you want to test one at a time we are testing. So, corresponding to that particular value of k you calculate gamma k square and rho 1 again is the variance of the residual series. So, we know uh, rho 1 cap and gamma k will com compute simply alpha k square plus beta k square as we did in our uh, spectral analysis n is the total number of values that you have. So, gamma k square is equal to alpha k square plus beta k square for the particular value of k uh, as I mentioned here gamma k corresponds to the periodicity being tested. So, in this case we may be testing for this particular value and the omega k that we do uh, in our uh, spectral analysis let us say that this is omega k we are writing and this is i k with our uh, notations we pick up that particular omega k and then for that particular k uh, we compute gamma k. Then rho 1 cap uh, I am sorry I mentioned this as the variance 
rho 1 cap is computed based on your E t this is actually minus alpha 1 cos omega k t this is corresponding to that particular k value omega k minus beta cap sin omega k t whole square and alpha k we know 2 by n this is from our spectral analysis. So, alpha k and beta k you get directly from the spectral analysis. So, rho 1 cap is obtained from this for that particular periodicity which we are examining now. I again repeat this test tests one periodicity at a time. So, we pick that particular omega k and then corresponding to that k we calculate gamma k and similarly rho 1 cap is known. Uh, see here you, uh, all these values are known alpha k is known alpha cap is alpha k actually and then you have the beta k value which is also known uh, for completeness sake let me make this correction this is alpha k cap and this is beta k cap uh, for that particular k and then uh, you calculate rho 1 cap. So, rho 1 cap is known in this statistic gamma k is known rho 1 cap is known and therefore, you can com compute the statistic. Now, uh, the periodicity for which the test is being carried out is 2 pi by omega k. Let us say you obtain uh, a 12 months periodicity even in the residuals, then the corresponding uh, value of omega k is 2 pi by uh, that particular periodicity. So, the statistic eta e is approximately distributed as f 2 n minus 1 n minus 2, where alpha is the significance level. Uh, the f distribution tables if you look up in any standard uh, textbook they will give for each of the significance level the number of degrees of freedom and for the number of values. So, let us say you choose f alpha as f 0.95 or alpha as 0 0.95 95 percent significance corresponding to 95 percent significance uh, you compute these. In fact, this is just the same test that we did in our uh, spectral analysis to identify the significance of periodicities. And then you check the statistic that value of the statistic that you have calculated eta of e if this is less than f alpha 2 n minus 2 then the periodicity is not significant. Let us say that your spectral analysis like this shows up 2 or 3 different periodicities. First you test for this periodicity if this is not significant then naturally these uh, periodicities may not be significant if they are all uh, in decreasing order like this. However, you may have uh, a case where this may be significant if one of them is significant then you have to test for the next periodicity also. So, you keep testing for the periodicities until you are satisfied that all the periodicities that are, that are thrown up by the spectral analysis of the residual series are all insignificant. Then the series passes the test even if one periodicity is significant then uh, the particular model does not pass the test. Now, for the significance of periodicities we also have another test which is called as the cumulative periodogram test or the Bartlett's test. Uh, the advantage of this Bartlett's test is that unlike the previous test that I just explained, this test examines all the periodicities at one time rather than going by one periodicity to another and therefore, this is computationally convenient. So, the test is more convenient and is preferred because of its ability to test all the periodicities at a time. So, essentially what we do in this uh, test is that we form a cumulative periodogram as follows. We define gamma k for k is equal to 1 to n by 2 as I mentioned this is a validation test. So, this is validation period for the n by 2 values you calculate gamma k square corresponding to each of the k you know omega k from your uh, spectral density you, you would have computed this 
and uh, E t is that particular value of the uh, residual series and you are summing over t is equal to 1 to n, t is equal to 1 to n and therefore, all the terms are known here. So, for k is equal to 1 you get gamma k, k is equal to 2 you get gamma k and so on. So, like this for k is equal to n by 2 you have gamma k square. Then you plot you determine uh, g k as j is equal to 1 to k summation gamma j square. So, from 1 to k you are adding up gamma j square. So, g 1 you have 1 term, g 2 you have 2 terms, 3 you have 3 terms and so on. Like this you calculate uh, summation of this divided by over the entire period k is equal to 1 to n by 2 gamma k square. So, the plot of g k versus k is called as the cumulative periodogram. So, you know how to compute g k all values are known here therefore, you can calculate gamma k once you know gamma k you sum up to k and then get g k by normalizing with respect to the entire sum here. And because of this nature g k varies from 0 to 1 the maximum value it can take is 1. Then we plot k, uh, k on the x axis and g k on the y axis. Now, I will explain this with respect to this figure. So, you computed g k and you have the k values. So, this is the plot this black line you are seeing is the plot of g k versus k for the residual series. Now, on this we have used n by 2 values and the maximum value of g k is 1. So, draw a line between 0 and n by 2 comma 1 uh, this corresponds to a frequency of 0 0.5. So, 0 0.5 comma 1 on the frequency diagram. So, draw a line this is the red line here on this line on either side of this red line you draw the confidence bands. The confidence band is gamma uh, th that is lambda divided by root of n by 2. So, this is lambda by root n by 2 on either side of the line so drawn. So, like this you get a band band now this is a band. If your cumulative periodogram that you have drawn any part of that goes above or below goes beyond the bound that you have drawn then the series does not pass the test. In fact, it means that corresponding to that particular let us say that it was beyond this particular band at a particular k value the periodicity corresponding to that particular k value in the residual series is significant. If the periodogram completely lies within this band then it is not significant. So, this is how we examine the significance of the periodicities. So, let me summarize that. So, you draw first the cumulative periodogram by considering g k by constructing g k for each of the k values you have n by 2 values and therefore, you construct g k versus k for n by 2 values. And then on the cumulative periodogram two confidence limits given by lambda by root n by 2 are drawn on either side of the line joining 0 0 and n by 2 1 n by 2 1 what is 1 1 is the maximum value of this and n by 2 corresponds to your k max there is a maximum lag. In fact, this corresponds to a frequency of 0 0.5. Then uh, what is this lambda value? The value of lambda for 95 percent confidence limit is 1.35 and for 99 percent confidence limit is 1.65. In fact, this test also I have taken it uh, from uh, uh, Kashyap and Rao. So, you can refer to Kashyap and Rao these are the values prescribed for this. So, you know how to draw the bounds now you know uh, you have drawn the cumulative periodogram you also know how to draw the bounds. Now, if all the g k values lie within the significance band there is no significant periodicity present in the series which means that the series passes the test. 
if a particular value of gk lies outside the significance band the periodicity corresponding to that value of gk is significant and therefore the series does not pass the test so this is how we calculate uh, we carry out the bartlett test or uh, the cumulative periodogram test uh, mo in most of the cases if the models are uh, acceptable of uh, the residual series typically gives uh, typically lies well within the bounds that you have drawn it hardly comes uh, very close to these bounds uh, in fact when i uh, discuss the case studies it will be uh, clear however just for your uh, curiosity what you can do is you draw the cumulative periodogram also for the original data then you will see that there are several periodicities which are uh, lying uh, way above and below this particular band either on this side or on this side so indicating that the periodicities are significant now we will see the white noise test so what we did is for the periodicities we have uh, now two tests and typically we prefer the bartlett test because of its ability to test all the periodicities in one go and also computationally it is very simple that means you simply calculate gk uh, much like your correlogram uh, you formulate the periodogram with respect to lag k you calculate gk values and uh, plot this and uh, immediately this uh, uh, significance comes up whereas in the first test that we had we formulated a statistic corresponding to each of the periodicities that we suspect to be significant we have to uh, make that particular test and therefore the bartlett test is preferred for test of periodicities now we will test for white noise or the uh, assumption that we made that the series is uncorrelated the residual series that we formulate is uncorrelated so we in this we have the wittels test for white noise wittels test we formulate again the covariance matrix remember we are dealing with the uh, et series that is the residual series so the covariance rk at lag k of the error series et is calculated this is simply rk is equal to 1 by n minus k j varies from k plus 1 to k k goes from 0 to k max k max can be typically uh, 0.5 uh, 0.15 n here ej into ej minus k then once you know the the covariance that is rk is given you formulate the covariance matrix so covariance matrix will be of the size k max by k max it is symmetrical r0 r1 r2 etc rk max like this you formulate tau n1 this is a covariance matrix and uh, we denote it by tau n1 then we formulate a statistic so essentially we determined the covariance and co formulated the covariance matrix using the covariance matrix we uh, define a statistic eta e is equal to n is given n1 is k max minus 1 rho not is lag zero correlation which is 1 and rho 1 cap i'll define now minus 1 row 1 cap here is deter, uh, determinant tau n1 by determinant tau n1 minus 1 uh, tau n1 is given here so this is a matrix the determinant of this is uh, used here determinant tau n1 now tau n1 minus 1 is constructed by eliminating the last row and the last column from the t n1 uh, tau n1 matrix that is you have this matrix you delete this row uh, i am sorry the last row and the last column you delete this row and this column so you will have tau n1 minus 1 and the determinant of that that is what is used here so you can formulate row 1 cap so you know n here n1 is known k max rho not is 1 and rho 1 cap is formed by rho 1 cap is calculated by taking the determinant 
tau n 1 tau n 1 is defined here then take out the last row and last column take the determinant and that is what defines determinant of tau n 1 minus 1 therefore row 1 cap is known and therefore you calculate this particular uh, statistic. Once that statistic is known this statistic is approximately distributed as f alpha n 1 n minus n 1 n 1 is your k max typically taken as 15 percent of uh, your n. So, as, as we did for earlier tests using the f distribution you fix your confidence uh, level typically 95 percent or 99 percent n 1 is known capital N is known which is the number of values and therefore, you know the critical value of f uh, uh, alpha. If the value of eta e that you calculate this value if the value that you calculate is less than f alpha then the residual series is uncorrelated. So, this is what we do for white noise test white noise is the series is uncorrelated. This is called as the Wittles test. In fact, we have another test uh, for uh, examining whether the series E t is uh, in fact white noise or not. It is called as the Port Montu test. Now, this test is also carried out to test the absence of correlation in the series. And this also uses the R k as defined earlier that is the covariance matrix as we have defined earlier this covariance matrix is used. So, you know how to formulate the covariance matrix from the covariance matrix we start defining another statistic in the port Montu test. So, using the covariance matrix R k here a statistic eta e is defined n is the number of values n 1 is your maximum lag and R k is corresponding to uh, the covariance uh, of order k and then R naught is uh, the covariance of order 0. So, k is equal to 1 to n 1. So, you know how to calculate the statistic value. Now, this statistic is approximated as approximately distributed as chi square distribution with uh, argument n 1. So, you fix the alpha and n 1 n 1 is your uh, k max which is the uh, maximum lag sub to which you have gone and from the chi square tables you can get this value the value n 1 is chosen again as 0.15 n. So, get the chi square alpha n 1 value from the tables if your eta e that uh, you have calculated is less than the critical value of alpha then the residual uh, series is uncorrelated. So, for the uh, white noise test that means to examine whether the series is uncorrelated or not we have two tests namely Wittles test and the Port Montu test in both of them we use the covariance matrix covariance matrix of the residual series and then formulate a st statistic. Now, uh, between these two Kashyap and Rao have proved uh, the same textbook that I have been mentioning they have proved that the Port Montu test is uniformly inferior to Wittles test and we prefer the latter for applications. So, while there are two tests uh, that are mentioned if you if you are in a fix which one to use you always go for the Wittles test as uh, as shown by Kashyap and Rao. Now, before we go to the applications uh, essentially what we have done is that we have formulated the models ARMA type of models and then we have made the tests and then we now start applying to different case studies. So, uh, let us summarize what we did on the choice of the ARMA models. Uh, this is not just uh, what I have covered in this uh, lecture, but also on the previous uh, two lectures. We formulate the ARMA models after differencing the series ARIMA that is autoregressive integrated moving average models. Uh, the order of differencing whether it is a first order or second order differencing depends on uh, the non stationarity present in the data. So, you do the differencing essentially to convert the data into a stationary data once you have the data uh, as a stationary uh, time series then you apply this ARMA type of models. 
Now, in the ARMA models, you know how to estimate the number of AR parameters and the number of MA parameters. In the event that you are not very clear about how many AR terms to use, how many MA terms to use, etcetera, uh, you form the candidate models, a large number of candidate models, and then apply these candidate models to the observed time series, estimate the parameters and calibrate the uh, models using part of the series. Typically, we use half the length of the data to calibrate the series and use these models for validation for the remaining half, remaining uh, part of the data. When you apply these models for the remaining part of the data, you get the residual series that is ET series. We do the tests of validation on the residual series. We do essentially three different tests. One is to test whether the residual series has a 0 mean or the mean of the residual series is not significantly from uh, significantly different from 0. That is the first test that we do. Then we test whether the residual series that, that uh, we have obtained by applying the model are is divide of any pe significant periodicities. So, you may come up with some periodicities, you test for the periodicities. We saw two tests for uh, uh, periodicity for significance of periodicities and we normally prefer the cumulative periodogram test for uh, significance of periodicities. Then we also examine whether the series E t that we have obtained is in fact white noise or it is uncorrelated. For that again we had two tests, the Port Montu test and the Wittles test. Uh, it is uh, shown in uh, the standard textbook Kashyap and Rao that the Wittles test is better than the Port Montu test. So, we uh, apply the models, make all these tests and then uh, make sure that the model that you have chosen either based on the maximum likelihood criterion or the minimum mean square uh, criterion passes all these tests and then choose that particular model for application. We will continue the discussion and specifically we will see how to apply uh, these models whatever uh, procedure that I have explained so far. We will see the applications of these in the coming lectures. Thank you for your attention.